Greetings and welcome to where the sun always shines. It is Lynx reading for you today as usual. Let's continue this story. The word document was still blank. It had been blank for the last few months and that was a fact that didn't change no matter how much Blake stared at it. There were supposedly two pages for. He stared and he stared and he stared, hard enough to burn a hole through the screen of his desktop monitor, but it made no difference. He flexed his fingers, trying to bring them to the keyboard, but they soon fell away like autumn leaves from withered tree branches. It was then that he realized. You know what, I need to crank this up a little bit. He was. Afraid. Of what? I wonder. Like that. Blake had never been afraid of writing before. He had experienced numerous emotions in regards to the art in the past. Excitement, enthusiasm, and quite often irritation, but not fear. Why should he be afraid of something? that he loved. Loved. Past tense. He truly had loved writing once upon a time, but he had loved it the most when he hadn't been obliged to set words out on a page. Writing had been its most magical when he was still a young boy, hiding away in his school library and spinning stories about the fantasy world. Celeriac. It was so stupid in retrospect, Blake couldn't help but scoff at himself. What an idiot. As if a silly, sumpy fairy story with a name based around a plant, also known as Nope Celery, could ever sell. But back then, when he had been a starry eyed youth, he hadn't cared about selling the copies. He had only cared about expressing himself. Writing had been a form of escapism. Now, however, writing felt the prison, precisely because he was obliged to do it. How could one enjoy an obligation? If you think about it, I mean, that kind of story about work, right? <laughs> that Blake reflected was the worst feeling in the world. It was like having an argument with a beloved friend. He had adored writing once. Now he hated it. He had started to hate it slowly over the last few months. But he had tried to push these feelings to one side because they were scary. Even he, a grown man, who enjoyed watching live surgical operations, was scared of some things. He was scared of all the things, actually. Getting older, getting grayer, getting fatter, oh yeah. Dying sad and alone because Cynthia was no longer here and he'd never see her smiling at him ever again, even though he loved her. Yeah, he had loved her so much. But in the end, love didn't mean much of anything, not if it could end so easily, it was even more ephemeral than a breath of air. The guttering flame of a candle. I mean, dying alone is scary, yeah. Maybe, maybe that really was it. Christiana would be his first and last novel, and it had not been particularly successful. That just about summed up Blake's life. He had published Christiana several years ago, when he was 26. Since then he had survived as a writer on the slow but steady revenue generated from sales. I mean, it's still nice to have that possibility like that, right? Holy crap, I would like that too. Watch some ads. <laughs> I'm kidding. 
He had also taken on a handful of extra news jobs, churning out quick scripts around 50,000 words a pop for Mills and Boone. Okay. Virgin and When he first applied, sending off a free to, uh, the three chapters of an exotic love story, The Virgin and the Viscount, or some approximation thereof, under the name Sheridan Sleeve, Cynthia had laughed at him. Blake had laughed at himself too. It was hard not to see the funny side of it. I mean, I guess she, she he's also getting, uh, I guess, some money from those, right? Under not his real name. He was a young man at the time, younger than he was now. I mean, it's tough to get younger when you move into the future, yeah. But he was pretending to be a woman, selling his work to women, while writing about shy, timing the virgins in Victorian London happening upon wealthy aristocrats. Some dudes did that thing exactly recently, right? I think three dudes were writing as supposedly as a woman, and I think they won some award. <laughs> That was not. Anyway, but maybe it wasn't so very laughable. While the Virgin the Viscount had been notably different in tone and register to Christiana, there were similarities. The drama, the passion, the Baroque. A tiny baby faced heroine in a white nightgown and a mysterious older man who swept her off her feet. Her feet. Another Eric and Christian. Really, but reimagined and repainted. More attractive with a happier ending. I see. While Blake had been brainstorming ideas for his future novel, his next serious effort, as he inwardly referred to it, he wrote short, cheap, smutty romances. It wasn't what he had in mind when, at the age of 15, he'd printed with tight lipped seriousness that he wanted to be a writer on the car sleep passed around in his form room. But even writers had to eat. If romance novels starring shy virgins and rich aristocrats were that sold, then that was what Blake would write. And he did write it. He wrote it for four years, publishing 11 50,000 words novels during this time, while turning over the years for the next Christiana. 11, holy shit. 11 visual novels, basically. Kind of. I mean, 50,000 words, that's only the visual novel. Christiana, but better. More mature. With much, much more to say. Surely. Definitely. Hopefully. But maybe not. My hair are white. Uh, wild. Anyway, as the time passed, Blake continued to write historical romances with virgins and aristocrats, but no progress was made on his next masterpiece. Maybe there was no next masterpiece. How could there be, when there was no first masterpiece to build upon? He was deluding himself if he thought Christiana was anything special. Maybe it had been special once, but now... In a desperate attempt to prove himself, Blake had cut short his contact with Mills and Boone. He left his 12th novella, The Highwayman's Bride, unfinished. 30,000 words. It was almost done. The shy virginal heroine Elizabeth had staged a sham marriage with the dashing silver tongue highwayman, Jack, by means of escaping a prolonged engagement with the ugly and unattractive Earl of Worces Worcestershire. But as was to be expected, then sham marriage between Elizabeth and Jack had not been a sham after all. Elizabeth had been deceived. And just like that, she found herself the newest possession of the thieving, conniving rogue. And that was when Blake stopped. Enough was enough. He couldn't keep writing such trite stories, even if they sold well. Huh. Is that so? Fair. Uh, far, far better than his precious Christiana head. Huh. He had to write something for himself. Something divorced from virgins and viscounts, or virgins and highwaymen, or virgins and pirates, or 
virgins and doctors, or you won't guess, virgins and convicts, or I mean just virgins in general, really. One really could get tired of them. Maybe. But maybe Blake had been writing about them for too long, because no words came when he sat down at his computer. No words had come for the last year. At first, Cynthia had been supportive. Then she was less so. And then she was gone. Just like everything else in Blake's life. Well, at least he still had Lawrence. The fluffy black cat was curled up in Blake's lap, his paws butting lazily at his owner's chest. Well, not that lazily, but yeah. Lawrence's clothes were extended, and they tore minute holes in Blake's sweater. Hey! Blake gave Lawrence a rap about the head with his knuckles. Knock it off, you little bastard, that hurts! Lawrence tipped his head to one side, his large emerald eyes blazing. Before, with a sudden hiss, he leapt away. He landed on the floor on all fours and prowled out of the room with his tail stuck up proudly in the air. Blake watched him go, his eyes narrowed. Well, you can just freak off then! But that didn't make Blake feel any better. In fact, it made him feel worse. Yeah, obviously. It wasn't like Lawrence could understand him. Or could he? With a groan, Blake pressed his hands against his face. So, not even Lawrence loved him. Well, screw the fool little freaker, it was not for Blake did everything for him. He only provided a finicky feline milk and food and a roof over his head and a bed to sleep in a stupid, boundless, unconditional love. But it wasn't enough. Loving something, or someone, wasn't enough to ensure that they would love you. Unfortunately, yeah. Hey Blake! Do you want me to get you tickets or not? Tickets? That's right! For Blood Brothers, I mean! Oh! Oh, uh, Blood Brothers, uh, of course. Mm, how could I forget? I'll give it some thought. You can think about it as much as you want, but you need to come to a decision soon. The musical starts in a couple of weeks. Two weeks? Has it been that long already? Wait, she said couple, not two, right? Yeah. Time flies when you're having fun. I don't know if I've been having fun exactly, but I guess I've been surviving. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, time flies even when you are just surviving. Sunny glanced about the kitchen. She looked at the unread newspapers on the welcome mat. She looked, wait, they are getting newspapers to their house? That's so cool! She looked at the dirty dishes piled high in the sink. I wish we would get that. She looked at the overgrown tangle of watercress by the window sills that would never be eaten. She looked at it all and frowned. <laughs> Surviving, had Blake said. She wasn't sure about that. If the kitchen home ever got this messy, my mother would flip her lid. <laughs> It's a good thing I'm a grown man who doesn't live with your mother, then. You don't need to be so sarky. I was just commenting. And maybe I don't want you to just comment on my state. On the state of my home. It's not up for discussion. Fine. And the musical? Like I said, I'll give it some thought. Actually, I was hoping for an answer today. If you want me to get you ticket, you need to be prompt about it. Prompt. Blake groaned. The mere mention of the word filled him with dread. He hadn't been prompt about anything for the last half a year. 
Not waking up in the mornings. Oh, so jealous. Or brushing his teeth. What? Brush your teeth, you bastard. Or having shower. Go take a shower on that. Or making food. Eat something. Or paying the bills. Okay, you have to... How, how is he still able to, like, you know, have electricity and so on then? <laughs> what the hell? None of it seemed to matter. Not anymore. Look, Sonny. You might think you're doing me great favor, inviting me to this play of yours. But did you ever stop to think about how I feel? Excuse me? Sonny stared at him. She took a step back, her behind bumped against one of the kitchen cabinets. Foch had known Blake for a good four months and had seen him lose his temper on more than one occasion. Never before had it felt so uncomfortably intense. I don't know what he's doing. He usually got upset about. Oh, Sandino. Petty silly things. Gerald Butler mostly. But his anger had never been directed at her. Not like this. Blake, however, remained unmoved. Don't you get it, Sonny? I don't want to go to your silly play. I'm a grown man. I'd look like a fool if I saw a play performed by a bunch of children. Children I have no relation to, might I add. You, you do have a relation to me, we're a... We're a what? Sunny's mouth opened and closed, but no words came out. Not a single syllable. What were they? Uh, friends? They'd known one another too long to be mere acquaintances, but the age gap was too large for them to be friends. I mean, she... Uh, yeah, maybe. Not proper friends. How could a 15 year old girl and a man in his 30s be friends anyway? Yeah. It's kind of weird. I feel like... If it's under... Uh, I don't know, I might be stretching this a bit, but... It's, uh, I don't know, under eight years, it's okay? I don't know, maybe I'm stretching it a bit, but still. You can ask me to tag along to your play as a plus one, Sonny. Not when you haven't even told your parents or friends about me. How did you... Oh, please, it's so obvious. Why would you tell anybody about me? I'm an embarrassment. That isn't true. But it is. You'd be embarrassed to be seen with me. Hell, I'm embarrassed to be seen with me, but I don't have a choice. You do. Well, I guess you do, but, and, and you know what? I'm invited because I want you to come. Because you pity me. I... Once more, Sandy's mouth opened and closed like a mousetrap. Her teeth, two neat rows of pearly whites, snapped together. Her eyes narrowed, her face flashed darkly, obscuring the fine smattering of demerara freckles sprinkled across her cheeks and nose. So maybe, maybe Blake was right. Maybe she was inviting him because she pitied him, but he didn't need to phrase it like that. You know what? What? Sun's fingers clenched to fists and her sides, her knuckles popped. He didn't need to be such a... Such a... You're such a dick! Oh, you're so saintly, Sonny. I didn't even know you could swear. I don't, not often. You're just so infuriating. Cynthia's had that a lot. And it's no wonder. I'm surprised she put up with you. So maybe I'm inviting you to my play out of pity. I feel sorry for you sitting around the house watching those awful medical dramas and slowly wishing way like the people being got up on those big levels, but you don't seem to care. I'm surprised you didn't hear the news. Caring is awfully uncool nowadays. In today's internet era, internet capital letter by the way, of replying to people behind screens with short sharp words comprised of four letters or less, caring was utterly unnecessary. Well, too late.
You are telling me that? Nothing more than a burden. Sonny, being 15 years old, should have known that much. Unless she doesn't have the access to the internet. Or it's, you know, a short amount of time, something like that. But she looked unconvinced. No, 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 no. Unconvinced wasn't the right word. She looked angry. Shut the freak up! Sonny! I said, shut the freak up! You know, this is getting a little too intense for my liking. Cut it out! Stop making funny comments and just listen! Really, listen! I can't help but listen, you're an inches away from me. Well, good! Use this as an opportunity to learn something then. You're a young adult. Yes, you are still young. Thank you. Yes, I'm still young. And you have so much life ahead of you, but you've already decided it's over. Now you're just sitting around doing nothing, not even trying to live and you don't cook and you don't clean and you don't... You don't do anything! There was a small silence. Blake surveyed her with tired eyes. His lips pursed into a frown. Sun's chest was raising and falling, her hair disheveled. A few loose tendrils had come untucked from behind her ear, but she didn't brush them aside. No. She was angry, yes. But at the same time, Blake had never seen her looking so vulnerable. Her true emotions were laid bare. And it would only take a handful of cruelly, carefully chosen words to destroy them. Don't do it, don't do it. Don't do it, you bastard. Don't you dare. So, are you quite finished with the theatrics? Wait, what? Is yourself aggrandizing front over? Can I move on with my life now or do you have more to say? What? I was, I was sick. I'm worried about you for... And I appreciate the concern, but I'm a grown man. Supposedly. I'll worry about myself. But you don't! Look at your kitchen, look at yourself! Everything's starting to ruin and maybe you could counter if you, if you tried, but you're not trying! And you think going to a stupid school play is going to help that? Uh, I just thought you might like it. I know you like musicals, and you've been hoped I've been inside for fuck long. You need to get out of the house, you're stagnating in here. I'll be fine. I have a lot of plants. They keep the air clean. But you don't even water them. Well, maybe they match my mood. Dying plants for a dying man. You... you... I what? You're not interested in trying, are you? Maybe I was once, but not anymore. I've been trying for far too long and look where it got me. I'm all alone. I can't work. I can't write. I can't even get out of the bed most days. And God knows how I'm going to pay my bills. What a mess. That's right. You really are a mess. Sonny. I knew it. You really do need more help than Mrs. Sloan. You know, she's in her 80s, but she's still so full of life. She has a bad hip, but she still does yoga. And she attends Italian speaking classes. And she even doubles in tarot card reading. Her life's nearly over, but she acts like it's just beginning. You, meanwhile. You act like your life is already over when you would have so much left for, to live for. If only... If only you tried. Like your school play. It isn't just about the play and I didn't invite you for your selfish sake. I want that you do come. I want that you do come for me. Sonny. I want you to come because I liked you and you helped me and I thought it would be my nice way to repay you anyway. I wanted your support for fuck's sake. <laughs> that last part, my addition, right? I just wanted you to watch me. But I guess it doesn't matter now, because it's just a stupid play, even though I worked hard. I worked so hard. <gasps> no, no, son, I didn't mean it, I like... It doesn't matter how we meant it, because that's what it sounded like. You don't care about me or my feelings. <laughs> you don't value the time we spend together because you're too busy being sad and self-obsessed. Well, I've had enough. 
Damn, that kitchen counter is going to be destroyed. <laughs> Sunny stomped one foot against the ground. Okay, it's the, okay. The floor is going to be wrecked. It didn't really have the desired effect, given she'd already removed her shoes, but at least it got her point across. She was tired. Fed up. Finished. And I thought I could help. <laughs> it's clear you don't want helping, you'd rather be an asshole. I deal with enough assholes at school, I'm not going to deal with them in my spare time too. Very well. Sunny showed her feet inside her shoes, not bothering to tie the laces and slammed the full front door behind her. Her with a heavy foot. Oh boy, the door also getting destroyed. Ooh, she slammed it so hard a few pictures hanging in the walls. The river that you and the skyline of Venice trembled. In fear, one of Cynthia's heel shoes toppled over like the Tower of Babel. It seemed almost prophetic somehow. That shoe had been sitting upright for six months alongside its fallen companion. Now both had hit the floor. Just like Blake's mood. Oh god. He freaked up. Blake winced, his eyes stung, he could feel tears welling up, but that was ridiculous. Why should he cry? She wasn't Cynthia. It was only Sunny. A silly secondary second... Secondary second... Secondary school student, like she had said. But he might have been an adult to use the loosest sense of the word, but he was far, far sillier, much stupider, self obsessed. Sunny was right. She'd been right about a lot of things. He really was an asshole. Like all the things in life. He hadn't realized how much Sunny had meant to him until she was gone. January 1st, 4 a.m. Welcome to New Year. Oh boy. The time went by far too slowly, as denoted by the bottom right corner of Blake's desktop. Not that Blake spent much time looking at it. He had no idea how many weeks had passed since he had driven Sunny from his home, but he hadn't seen the young girl since then. Not now, sorry, now it was January. The start of a new year, as I already said, but Sunny must have performed her silly little musical already. But no, it wasn't silly, not to Sunny, in her small fishbowl sized sphere of experience. A secondary school production of Blood Brothers could easily be inflated with undue importance. She was only 15, for godness sake. Why had he been so cruel? But it was too late to worry about that now. This was it. He'd freaked up his relationship with Sunny just like he freaked everything else up. At this point, who was left in Blake's lonely life to alienate? Plants? At least you still like me, boy. Blake mumbled under his breath, scratching low red behind his ears. The black cat purred content at the attention. It seemed Lawrence had forgiven Blake for his harsh comments a couple of weeks ago, for the cat had done a damn good job of avoiding him the last fortnight. Lawrence had dragged no shortage of dead birds across the welcome mat in the kitchen. Uh. Blake knew why he was doing it. It was revenge. It was a good thing Sun didn't go in for the avian mutilation method of payback that Lawrence did. At least Blake didn't think she would. It didn't really seem to suit her character. He wasn't sure, however. It was hard to tell. Given he'd never managed to upset her quite this much before. Maybe that had been his true calling all along. Not writing. Never writing. Hmm. He was no author. He was just an asshole. Well, author and asshole were two titles that seemed to go hand in hand, just look at the romantics and they had lived nearly 200 years ago. Nowadays you had Harlan Ellison, Brett Easton Ellis, David Foster Wallace, I have no idea who that is, 
assholes, all of them, self-obsessed in a horribly obnoxiously self-pitying kind of a way. I mean, I will trust on that. At least until they died. Would he too die like that? Sad and alone, having driven everybody else away in his life, it was beginning to seem like that. He'd spent the last seven months of his life bemoaning Cynthia's absence, outwardly calling her a biatch. While inwardly missing her, so actually it was like a physical age. To plug this gap inside his chest, Blake had turned to medical documentaries girlish for they were. Yeah. It had happened quite by chance, really, when he'd been sitting in the living room, nursing a lukewarm cup of coffee and flicking through the TV channels. Deal or no deal, come dine with me, pointless, and street doctor. Street doctor were people with embarrassing medical alignments. Alignments? Oilments, ailments, 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 displayed them on a camera in the middle of the street, no less, for all to see. Varicose veins and ingrown two nails. Rotting teeth and halitosis. Blake had been <coughs> about to flip the channel in disgust, like most sensible people. But something about the faint misery that clung to these sagging, skinned, grey faced, fish eyed people struck a chord within him. His life might have been bad, but it wasn't that bad. <coughs> so he kept watching in a semi-self-aware state of self-disgust. Soon, the petty ailments showcased in Strict Doctor weren't enough. He had to get another fix. A higher dosage. That was where the internet came in. Wouldn't you know it? There was a whole glut of these series uploaded on the internet. There were more medical documentaries than you could shake a stick at. It seemed the consumer base for misery videos. That was what it was really was higher than Blake had ever imagined. Disgusting. Sonic had said his interests were sick, but there must have been thousands, maybe millions of like-minded sick people who got some sort of... Not really exactly, but consolation from seeing people sicker than them. What? But taking delight in the suffering of others hadn't made Blake feel better. It hadn't improved his self-esteem. It hadn't. Uh, it hadn't rekindled his muse. It hadn't brought Cynthia back. And it wouldn't bring Sunny back either. She had never liked the medical med documentaries. She thought they were unnecessarily macabre. She was right, of course. She was right about a lot of things, but... There is no but. It's disgusting. <laughs> oh, Sonny. You really are a silly girl. Despite all that, you still kept seeing me. And why? Because no matter how she sighed and tattled... Tatted? 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 And tatted and rolled her eyes. She must have liked Blake. It was a peculiar kind of liking, yeah. The root of a uh, more than healthy dose of pity. But she had trusted him enough to ask for his advice about her audition, and she had seemed genuine enough when she asked him to attend her performance. It was too late now, like many other things in Blake's life. But at one time, that young girl had tried. She tried harder for Blake's sake than, uh, than he ever had. Maybe then. He should try to apologize. For he didn't know her mobile number and he had no way to contact her. He could thank Sunny for her continued patience in another way. She had borrowed Christiana, Blake's debut novel. Blake didn't know how much of it she had read, but he now felt rather embarrassed about it. He had been proud of the novel every time, yeah and it had a little more sustenance than his endless string of virgin stories, but he could do better now. He should have been able to. If only he could write. He could do better now. No. There was no if only. He could write. 
he would write right here right now he was supposed to be a writer that was how he had first introduced himself to Sunny, and he didn't want to disappoint her not more than he had done already Sunny had supported him for oh such a long time despite having no real reason to do so so maybe there was still hope for him I mean to be fair he could just go to that other street right because it's the same street but in other part of the city for some reason so uh, that's how you do it <laughs> surely he knows the story right perhaps Sonny had seen something more to blink than he tried uh, than the tired lazy cynical mask he so often wore a mask designed specifically to protect him from the outside world well it was high time he got rid of all the presences why should he need to pretend now he was all alone, surrounded by his plants, illuminated by his monitor, with Lawrence lying in his lap? It was time to remove his mask. No more worries about getting hurt, he was old enough to know better. Pain was unavoidable. And it was precisely through pain that he could bring himself to place his fingers against the kiss once more. It was the only way. How could one ever hope to express something more than they were hiding, always hiding their own emotions, even from themselves? So he wouldn't worry. For the first time since he lost Cynthia, Blake finally let himself cry. A technically second because it happened when she stormed off but let's not get into details and ruin the mood i guess the air was crisp and cool blake shivered and burned his hands inside his pockets not that it did much good his pockets weren't really deep enough to do all that much digging in retrospect he probably should have worn a coat why hadn't he worn a coat the answer to the question was quite obvious he hadn't worn a coat because he was an idiot he exhaled softly. His air was visible in the cool early January air. It hung before visibly, like a small cloud. God. But going outside in England really was miserable. He'd forgotten. He couldn't remember the last time he'd escaped the relative safety of his neat square brick house. 24 William Street. Uh, he's, so he's doing that. The place he had bought with Cynthia, after looking around Peterborough, meticulously for the one perfect abode where they could be happy together, their dream home. Cynthia had picked out the curtains, she decided the color scheme, she hung up the paintings of various rivers and bought the plants, including the now uncontrollable growth of watercress sprouting on the windows in the kitchen, and the rectangular welcome mat at the front door. Cynthia had been homey like that. She was the kind of woman who liked poring over Argos catalogs and clippings of carpets. Carpets. Don't get carpets into your house, really. They are a pain in the ass to keep clean. She had taken great delight in populating the house with IKEA flat pack furniture and hunting bubbles, both from car boot sales. Yeah, IKEA furniture, exactly. <laughs> Blake didn't really care. He wasn't house proud, never had been. In the events, Lawrence didn't mix very well with bubbles, antique or otherwise. After Lawrence had smashed a glass vase filled with fox, daffodils, and a ceramic sailor boy, Cynthia had given up on her kitsch knickknacks. Maybe that had been an omen, a sign of things to come. Hmm, that house had once been a home. But it didn't feel like a home anymore. Not without Cynthia. Her things remained, but they were only that. Things. Even colder and deader than their previous owner. You needed more in life than stuff. It was like the pet shop boy said. You need more. You need it. sometimes black the pet shop boys hadn't said that of course that had been all sunny sunny cheeseman 
Oh, okay. We now know her surname, at least. Whom Blake hadn't seen in almost a month. But that made Blake want to see her all the more. He had to tell her something. Several somethings, in fact. He'd stopped watching those medical documentaries. Finally, he'd started to write again. Now he was even going outside. But how could he tell her? Unlike the eccentric Mrs. Sloan who lived at the other 24 William Street, who was not the psychic. Dude, you just told yourself the answer. Blake, despite his name being caged from the father of romanticism, was the least psychic person ever to exist in all of Peterborough. Maybe even all of England. Blake tried to jump his hands even further in his pockets, but it was too little avail. All hope was lost for his freezing fingers. <sighs> Despondent, he kicked at a pebble. It bounced. He watched it roll with the mild interest. The churchyard was silent as a... Well, as a mouse that might scream out said churchyard. The newer grooves were arranged in neat little rows like grey lozenges because the text emblazoned upon them was still legible. Dearly departed, sorely missed, much beloved, etc. Et the old graves were arranged in rows that were distinctly less neat. They were collapsing on themselves, shifted to one side like drunken sailors. They too were emblazoned with variation upon the well-worn phrase, rest in peace, but the words had been smoothed away with time, and they were ensnared with moss and ivy. It seemed inevitable, really. No matter how you tried to commemorate people, they were, at the end of the day, only people. Flesh and blood destined to sink back into the soil from whence they came. Within 50 years, or maybe 100, these newer graves, the ones from the 1919, 2000, 2010, would be similarly overgrown. The need to do well wishes for the afterlife smoothed away. That's true. The bodies would be long gone. Yeah. Nothing lasted forever. Maybe that was why Blake had wanted to become a writer. He wanted to leave some part of himself behind after he died. Something more of an erotic carcass and a sad grey tombstone. Well, who knows, maybe this will still be online in like 100 years and someone will run the video. Nice to see you. <laughs> <clears throat> Who knows if YouTube will last that long for, right? Maybe by that time YouTube will be gone. For, I mean, given that there is no competition at all and I don't know if we can have any in the future. Maybe it will still be here. But there was nothing more than a fool's errand. Why did he deserve to leave on after everyone else did? Did he even have anything interesting, insightful or useful to say? But that wouldn't stop him from trying. Not now. Not while he was still alive. If only he could talk to Sunny. A soft syllable fell from Blake's lips. It was soon carried away by the moaning wind. It was almost like a scene from a storybook, or else the final act of a movie. Sunny was standing by a grave with her head bowed. She was wearing the school uniform as per usual, so the new term must have started up already. Well, it was the 13th of January. Time really flew. Sunny's hair fluttered in the breeze, as did the ends of her scarf. It was a pale pink, the same color as her cardigan. Sunny? Ah! Uh. Sunny blinked and turned her head. She brushed a stray strand of hair behind her ear. Her do dewy like eyes widening. Blake! That's right, it's me, the one and only. I'm here in the flesh for a limited period only, roll up. 
There was a pause. Sun looked him up and down. Her snub nose wrinkled, as it always did whenever she had walked in on Lake watching one of those awful medical documentaries. Lake waited. The second seemed to go by very, very slowly. Was she going to scoff at him? Steer at him? Reject him? But... Gosh! You are such an idiot! Oh, Cheddar. I really did miss you. I didn't miss you calling me Cheddar. Not even a little... No, not in the slightest, but... I never expected you to actually apologize. Yeah, well... I did some soul searching this last month, this last month, and I came to a conclusion. What? I really am an asshole. I could have told you that much, you know. You did, quiet, loudly. In fact, I think the neighbors might have heard you. Like you care what anybody thinks. I didn't used to. I was so self-obsessed. The only thing I could think of uh, about was myself. But thinking about myself wasn't really getting me anywhere. That's why I tried to change my tune. Then I guess I'm happy for you. Thanks. I feel a little happier for me too. Christ, but it really is cold out here. You should have worn a scarf. Duly noted. I'll find it a way for future consideration. Scarves are awesome. I love scarves. So, Sonny, what are you doing here? Visiting my grandpa? Um... Something gestured towards the grave. Blake followed with his eyes, reading the short eulogy to the Delhi department Mr. Cheeseman, who lay beneath his granddaughter's feet. Abel Cheeseman, a beloved husband, father, and grandfather, 1934 2013. Uh, 79 years. Nice. In before that math was incorrect. <laughs> so it had been a few years since he passed. Maybe. Then it would be too horribly insensitive if Blake said. Does he have anything interesting to say? <laughs> you must think you're so funny. I do my best. And why are we here to see your grandpa? Is it his... Uh... What did you call the special date when you commemorated the person's death? Anniversary? Sound a bit too colors, like cake and balloons would be involved. I have no idea what you call it. Blake pondered, struggling for a while before Sun decided to help. Like... I don't know. No! But this is the date he died and neither it is his birthday! So just the date he died, okay. Then why? Do I need reason to see my own grandfather? I guess not. Does that mean you two were close? Not particularly. My granddad didn't get along too well with my dad. Why is that? Because he was with my mom. God damn it, man. <laughs> His own daughter. <laughs> because he married an Indian woman. Oh. So. Okay. He's like of... Uh old views person. Oh, I see. The gravestone says he was a beloved father, but I don't think my dad thought all that fondly of him. Not even in his final days, yeah. He was always so horrible to my mother. He never spoke to her properly. For Grandma Irene made an effort. If my mother tried to talk to him, he'd turn his head away or pretend to be conventionally deaf. He sounds like a miserable old coger. coger. Almost as miserable as I am. He was a little, yeah. As you might imagine, he wasn't too keen on me either. Then you came here to gloat? As if I do something like that, I'm not that petty. It's a good thing I haven't rubbed off on you. I really am that petty. I just... I don't know. I was feeling a little down, I guess. Something happened? Hmm, it's Mrs. Sloan. Francis, I should say. She... <laughs> she... 
suddenly pressed the tip of her shoe against the mossy ground. The soil was dumb from continued rainfall and her sense of lunch school shoe was getting moody, but Sun didn't seem to care. Maybe she was beyond caring. There are more important things in life than luck lace-ups from Clarks. She... She passed away at the beginning of the new year. Oh. The single syllable fell from Bo Blake's lips. It sounded horribly ineffect ineffectual to his own ears, but he had no idea what else to say. What did Sun expect from him? If only he had enchanting silken tones like Eric. But that was probably a bad idea too. He didn't want to lure a grief stricken son to any underground chambers beyond the river. Sticks illuminated in romantic candlelight. That might have seemed like a romantic gesture in the 19th century Paris, but it was the sort of behavior that would get one arrested nowadays. You liked her a lot, didn't you? I suppose so. She was an interesting woman, so full of life. I just... I never saw it coming. I didn't think she was going to die. She was the last person I would have expected. Even though she was so old. She didn't like like she was old. Honestly, I was more convinced you were going to bite the, da the bullet first. Yeah, well... Thanks for your concern, I guess. It's not really concern. Maybe I just wanted to get back at you. You deserve a few free shots. I really did act like a dick. You really did, yeah. There was a small pause. The wind continued to tug at the ends of Sun's scarf, making it flutter in the breeze like a paper streamer. Blake watched it for a few moments, almost entranced by its subtle snaking movements. Hey, Sonny. What? Do you wish I'd died instead of Mrs. Sloan? Of course not! Huh? But I am an asshole. You are, but you're not the kind of asshole who deserves to die. They, uh, there are degrees. Huh. <laughs> Glad to hear it. I just, I don't know. I didn't really know Mrs. Sloan, I guess, so I'm not too upset about it. I'm not her granddaughter. I'm no relation to her whatsoever. I just saw her a couple of times a week to brew her cups of tea and listen to her stories. It's just so sad and that's all. We all have to shuffle off this mortal coil eventually. This place is a testament to that. Hmm, I just wish it, wa wish it wasn't so depressing. Anyway, enough about me, why are you here? Me? Uh, I was just going for a walk. Gotta air out my lungs eventually. The plants can only do so much. Really? I thought you might have somebody you wanted to see. Like who? If you're talking about my grandparents, they are not buried here. In fact, I'm beginning to doubt my grandpa Albert will ever get buried. He's almost 95 and he's still going strong, the stubborn old goat. Grandma Ellen died 30 years ago, but he's kept himself alive out of his sheer spite. He's dead. Damn. Oh no! I didn't mean your grandparents. I was actually thinking about uh, your wife. My wife? I think her name was Cynthia. You spoke about her once or twice. Didn't you say she was dead? Cynthia? Dead? Good lord, no. I should be so lucky. But you said... She's dead to me now, certainly, but in her grave, resting in peace? Nah. She didn't die, she just cheated on me. I'm sorry to hear that. It's alright, it happened a while ago. Well, seven months. The affair probably started a year ago, for. Are you sure it's really alright? Hmm, maybe not. <laughs> I was quite upset about it at the time, to tell you the truth. Well, yeah? I mean, I imagine it would be f f fucking devastating. But it's all so ridiculous, I can't help but laugh. What do you mean? Of all the people in the world, she was cheating on me with our dentist. I mean, they are well well paid for, I mean, given that it's England. I mean, dentists aren't too good, do they? are they? 
At least that's how the world sees them. <laughs> Can you imagine it? I let that man stick his fingers in my mouth. Those same fingers used to fill up my wife. It's so delicious, it kind of blows your mind. Like props to the guy, I guess. Good on him. Or maybe not. You said it, but you don't really mean it. Bunny sounded... Bunny? What? But Sunny sounded unsure. Blake wasn't entirely sure either. I would be freaking heartbroken like crazy. If that would happen to me. He'd had half a year to get to grips with Cynthia's infidelity and for he liked to think he'd managed to get over her the hump, there were still times when he missed her terribly. He still hadn't drawn out the paintings of the reverse, or the piece lily in his study, or that single lonely onion bulb lying in the back of the fridge. Then again, I mean, cheating happens... I would say for reasons... Right? I... I don't know... Uh, I'm not going to try to explain something I don't know about anything, okay? He still hadn't thrown out the paintings of the reverse, or the piece Lily in his study, or that single lonely onion wall playing in the back of the fridge. Still, he'd get there eventually. Maybe. Everything in its own time. I know what I mean. I never do. I'm pretty indecisive guy, I guess. Okay, that's like me. Maybe that's why Cynthia went off with our dentist. Christ, for. I guess he has nice long fingers and he's not that low. Look at it by being so old. What do you mean? But come on. He's called Bruno. What kind of name is that? Yeah. It's a name just like any other. I know, but honestly, would you go out with a man called Bruno? It all depends on his personality, I guess. But Sunny couldn't stop her lips from quirking upwards into a small smile. Her shoulders shook, she tried not to giggle. But it was already far too late. <laughs> Maybe giggling in a graveyard was disrespectful, Sunny's grandpa certainly wouldn't have liked it. But then again, there were a few things in life he did like. So what? As Blake might have said screw him, he was dead to Sunny, and unlike Cynthia, this was meant in the most literal sense of the word. So Sunny giggled. The giggles must have been infectious, like hiccups, because soon Blake follow, found himself... Well, not giggling, because that wasn't masculine enough, but he was definitely laughing too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness! Does this make me a bad person? Mm, kinda, I guess. You started it! You didn't need to go along with me. Shame on you, Cheddar, for laughing at poor Bruno's name like that. <laughs> and then she was giggling again. She couldn't help it. It took a while. I mean, uh, I don't know. It's not a Polish name, that's for sure. I don't know any Brunos in Poland. Abroad, maybe it's a name actually, so you know. I think it is in Portugal. <laughs> Is it like a common name in Portugal? I wonder now. It took a while before her was abated enough for her to ask the following question. So Blake, if you're not here to see anybody important to you, why are you here? You know, just enjoying the scenery. Be serious, please. Alright, alright. If you must know, I came here to have a walk. I think this place is kind of relaxing. A graveyard? Okay, I agree with that. There is some relaxing feeling to graveyards. Like you think watching videos of people, poor people be having open heart surgery while you eat your breakfast is relaxing? N no, I grew out of that. I'm 32 now, too old to act so edgy. At least you realized it. Yep, no matter how much I might idolize him, I can't really live like Eric. I can't really live like Eric. Eric? The Phantom, obviously, don't you know? I didn't realize he had a name. I thought he was just called the Phantom. 
Well, of course he has a name, and no, his name is not Bloody Gerard. I never thought for a moment that, that it was. You really should watch that musical lend you Sunny. The book you can skip out on, but the musical you absolutely have to watch. I don't see why I should. You didn't come and watch my performance of Blood Brothers for the ID task. <laughs> I'll make it up to you next year. How? Oh, uh, I mean, when you go to sixth form, you will still be a part of the drama club, right? I guess so. Then I'll watch your next musical. I don't know if we'll do another one. Miss Possum by said it was quite a lot of effort. Most of the girls can sing for Toffee either, not even the girls in the school choir. Miss Possum by said if I hadn't been there, the whole thing would have fallen apart. I can believe that. I could have fallen apart when you left too. <laughs> you mean it? <laughs> Don't flatter yourself, I'm just kidding. Well, mostly. Mostly? Hmm, it's 70-30. And which way around is that ratio? That's for me to know, Cheddar, and to you to find out. Anyway, if you watch The Phantom with me, I'll come and see your next musical. I promise. Really? Really, really. We can even shake on it if you want. So I looked at Blake for a while with no small amount of trepidation. Her lips pursed and her eyes narrowed as for she had smelled something bad. Before, with a small sigh, she finally gave in. She didn't want to be mad at Blake. Not really. Even if he had missed her first foray into stardom as Willie Russell's Mrs. Johnston. There would always be next year. That's right. She was going to go to sixth form and she would continue to see Blake. And maybe they could still be friends. Alright, fine, it's a deal. Pleasure doing business with you. Oh, shut up. And if you think you could wrangle it, could you try to talk to Miss Passonby into putting on the Phantom next year? It really is one of my favorites. And why do you think she would listen to me? It sounds like you're a Miss Passonby's favorite too. You can do this for me, Sonny, can't you? Pretty please. Do you really want to see your favorite musical performed by a group of teenagers? Well, when you put it like that, maybe want is too strong of a word. I thought as much. You'll be shouting all sorts of abuse at the stage. Well, maybe if the person they pick to play Eric Duff's up his role, I'll have to file a formal complaint. Still, they can't do much worse than Gerard Bloody Butler. I like him. And you, my good woman, have no taste. <laughs> But even if you have no taste, I could never shout at you. Why is that? You'd make a wonderful Christine. You know, you've never even heard me sing. But I have faith in you. After all, you are my angel of music. What? <laughs> what do you mean? Okay, guys. That was where the sun always shines. Basically by Abby Hime, as you can see. Uh, except, I guess, for the music and the graphics, right? But the writing and programming, so like the main thing for this to work. By Abby Hime. She gives off really good stories, to be honest. Like, we played quite a few already. I, of course, don't remember which few did we play exactly, but you know what? We might as well check, why not? Each.io. So it's not on Each.io for, for, for the creations, but we played quite a few already. We did play When the Sun Always Shines, which is apparently one of the earlier ones. Nice! We played Six Days of Snow, that was on Steam. Really nice game. We played the sad story of Emmeline Burns, yes. And I'm pretty sure this had... This had additional story to it. But I don't remember which one it was. 
Uh, have I played this? I don't remember. I think I haven't. So, whatever. For now. Uh, we played Learning in Love not so long ago. We played... The dejection I note. That's the thing connected to the sad story of Emily Burns, kind of. We played Asphyxia. And today, we finished Where the Sun Always Shines. Hope you guys enjoyed. I had a, a ton of fun. Uh, I don't know. Like, I feel like I like it when there are... Like, if the, even if there is no voiceover. If there are two characters, let's go. If there is more, then I have a problem because... I keep forgetting the voices sometimes I give to characters. Over here it was two plus the narration. Nice. That's what it is about. <laughs> uh, I wonder how his next books would turn out for. Pretty sure he would come back to making them, to writing again. I'm curious how they would work out. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed. Hope you have a wonderful day. I'm going to sleep. You might also need to go to sleep if you are watching late. Uh, that's it. I'll see you in the next game. I have quite a few already lined up, so there will be more. Bye-bye.